Welcome to this talk. This is about uh, branding with jobs to be done. Um, it is a project that we uh, ran 2019 uh, until I would say uh, beginning mid mid 2020. Um, it was for us Eventbridge a very exciting, very challenging, uh, and intellectually very very interesting project. Uh, we had on the other side a very interesting project team ambitious project team and Rasmus will uh, give us a little bit of insights how it went and what they did. If you can go on the next slide, what, what is it all about? Asura, um, for, for those who might not know, Asura is, um, is a health insurance company in Switzerland. It was introduced in 1978 uh, in the French part of Switzerland. So for, for those of you who know, Switzerland is divided in a French, German and Italian part. French part is about 25 to 30% of the, of the population. And it was launched by a very, uh, very charismatic uh, founder. It was a startup at the time. Um, and and the, the brand was kind of um, very, um, very distinctive at the time. You can see here in French, I translate this. Um, it, it means if you have a small little uh, tiny cold, Asura is not for you. Um, however, if it's, if, if it's severe, then we're here for you. Um, the meaning was really that you, uh, if you have small little um, illnesses or diseases, just don't go to the doctor all the time. Uh, if you like this, then Asura is for you. Uh, if, if, if you. If you don't go to the doctor, then Asura is for you. So this was, this was introduced in 78 and it was really successful. Um, it grew from zero customers to 1 million customers um, over a period of 10, 15 years. Um, and the Sura became really the number one insurance company in the French part. In the German part, you don't know, many people don't know the brand or don't know the company, um, but that is because it was not really present here. Um, and this talk is about the story, how to take branding uh, and how to make branding, uh, how to use branding. It's really taking an already strong brand um, to the next level and uh, with jobs to be done. I would like to hand over to our guest here, the star of the, of the evening, Rasmus, if you could introduce yourself a little bit about your story and your role in the project. Yeah, uh, thank you, Beat. Um, yeah, Rasmus Quante is my name. I, I built my career at Procter & Gamble and Kellogg, so in FMCG companies. Um, I manage brands like uh, Ariel, uh, Lenore, at European or at global level. Um, and with Kellogg's then I worked on the Pringles brand, so that's uh, potato uh, chips. And from there I did the big move into the, into the insurance world. And, um, you know, I like to say that on, on the Pringles brand, uh, I had a brand that everybody loved, but it was a bit free of purpose. Of course, fun is also a purpose and being together with friends and family, but at the end of the day, nobody needs Pringles. And then I went into a category where mm, it's not fun, uh, nobody really likes it, insurance. Um, but the purpose is actually beautiful. Um, if you think about it, um, health is one of the most precious things we have. And um, we take it for granted in, in developed countries that there's a health insurance system. But look at the US even, um, it doesn't exist for everybody. So it's, it's just a nice uh, human invention. Um, and when you look at um, surveys in the Swiss population, you also see that after pensions, um, the health insurance and the high premiums you have to pay are the, biggest, uh, the second biggest problem the population has. And so I said, yeah, okay, yeah, that's, that's great. Quite a switch. I want to take the challenge. And I soon discovered that the challenge is much, much bigger than I initially thought because you have a product that you can't touch you can't set the price because for the base insurance and the healthcare system in Switzerland, the price is a function of the cost. Nobody wants it. People, everybody needs to have it. And most of the people never use the product. 
So imagine that from potato chips, you can put into your mouth, flipping the coin uh, completely, but I quite like the challenge. And that's why I said, okay, let's, let's do it. Okay. Um, thank you, Rasmus. Um, these are typically the challenge we also like. Uh, we work for all different kinds of uh, problems and in industries. Some are, are high interest, some are fun, some have uh, more purpose, some have less purpose. But what we really like to do is um, increase the success chances of growth projects. Growth projects for us are innovations uh, and we really try to make them uh, useful for the customers. So that's, that's a bit our mission, making useful innovations and helping these growth projects really to succeed. And we're doing this by uh, um, aligning um, all these, these uh, projects and these initiatives to the customer need. Um, one of the most powerful tools that we use is jobs to be done. And I think that's one of the reasons why you, uh, some of you have signed up. Jobs to be done is really a very effective logic. And I will talk more about it later. Um, I know I just calculated. I felt like, a, like an old dog. I use jo jobs to be done since more than 20 years. In fact, I met a guy uh, who was called Roger. Uh, and this Roger was working with a Tony and this Tony was Tony Alvik, and that was 20 years ago when they developed ODI at the time. And that was when I discovered jobs to be done and I worked with Roger at the time to really um, help to, to make jobs to be done actionable. Um, and, and, and that's Ventbridge. Ventbridge is a boutique consultancy specialized in this. Uh, we are a core team of highly competent uh, people who really focus on this mission of making uh, innovation projects successful. I hand over back to Rasmus. I think you can better talk about the challenge that you really, the specific branding challenge that you found. Yeah, so like in a way, Asura was outdated. Those who know the old brands, they, they would say, yeah, that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, but it's not even wasn't even the problem. We we had quite some success in the French speaking part. We had grown to one million customers. Oddly enough, we were always last in reputation rankings. Another odd thing for me as a marketeer: how can you have that growth when you don't have the best reputation? Where well, we had the low premiums, yes. In the German part, um, our market shares are very low. Yet this is where most of the population sits. And even in areas where we would be competitive with our premiums, you wouldn't see the growth we would have liked for. So we then said, yeah, time for a branding project. And I mean, it's not necessarily the starting point to look at competition, but looking at competition is, is one of the key things you, you got to do because you can't do exactly the same thing. You got to be different. Otherwise, why would people come and choose you? And um, it's a bit illustrative what you see in the pictures on, on the left that we picked out uh, the jogging theme. Um, but what's very obvious is that all competitors, they're going into, into things that are around the core product. So they go into services, into extras that the client gets around the core itself. And the very common theme um, is, the, um, is, the, is the sports theme. But yet, as everybody is doing it and everybody wants to give a little extra like KPT uh, is calling it, um, we believe that the air is thinner and thinner on, on, on that end of the, of the spectrum, yet it's a huge battlefield for, for all the others where they're going. So we knew that's probably not the area we want to be in, yet what, what is it then? uh what we wanted to um to to represent and and stand for so we said we look into all of these things um as well we can't probably break completely with our past we have one million customers we stand for something and there will be some golden nuggets in who we are otherwise we would not have seen the growth at least in the french part of the country so what is our heritage uh, what do we stand for? Where do we come from? Two is, um, who are these customers that we want to be relevant for? Um, are there segments out there that are sizable enough where we can score points with the benefits that we want to provide as a brand? 
And then three, um, I mentioned it, how to be different from competition. And four, very important, you can't be somebody, you can only be for a day or if you need to dress up beautifully, but it's actually not you, meaning if you don't have teams in place, um, call centers, uh, technical tools, uh, service elements, if you would need huge investments to get them into place in order to fulfill your brand promise, then you're probably not on the right track. You can stretch it a bit and say, we build a brand where we have also organizational development areas, we invest into certain uh, departments and things, but you, can't, you can only stretch it that far. Mm -hmm. Now, um, on the value. So I said, where do we come from? Um, what, what, what are these golden nuggets? What does Asura stand for? And, and probably you can all sum it up with one word and it's this word responsibility. Asura calls it shared responsibility, uh, responsabilité uh, partagée. And there's tons of things that hang on it. So in 1978, the big innovation in the market was actually to put out a franchise uh, self-deductible that didn't exist at the time. The first person, the first client we had was a man. I think he paid 47 francs because he signed for 2,500 uh, at the time. Sorry, it was 1,500 with the highest um, as a self-deductible. Uh, and that's, you can call it an innovation that also became a law in 96 when uh, um, the healthcare system was unified um in switzerland and in the self-deductible you have an element of shared responsibility if you go to the doctor but you pay yourself when you reach a certain amount and it gets really expensive for you we cover for you you have another thing that we call tier garant it's uh, you go to a pharmacy and you have to pay the bills um first yourself there's well there's an element of shared responsibility people have to take the wallet out and they will probably hesitate. Maybe they say, well, is there Generica? Uh, do you have a smaller pack? Or they will think twice and say, well, actually, Dafalgan, I have it home. I don't really need it. So you don't produce cost on medication. Face it, in Switzerland, more than a billion of medication uh, gets thrown away um, every year. So it's packs people have at home, and they go into the little bin. It's huge, huge cost that at the end also goes into the insurance premiums. All elements are um, self-service. Whatever you can do without calling and taking time from people we pay a salary that goes at the end into a premium again, you do. So we were the first to have a self-service center. We also, uh, surprising enough, the first to have an, an application, a mobile application. Uh, we stopped it uh, 10 years ago um, and now we came back with it. But Asura was very innovative on these, on these fronts. Um, last but not least, another value is this element of um, standing up for your convictions, uh, also in the sense of avoiding cost in the system. There's the story of the medication for when you have an eye problem, when you go blind, you can Google it up. There's one that's called uh, Lucentis. Uh, it's a Swiss pharma producer that owns it. And that is the one that is prescribed in Switzerland and is covered also by the health insurance. There's another medication that gets widely used in, uh, in Europe. Um, it's called Aventin, I think. And it's 10 times cheaper. It's as effective, but it is not on the official list. So Asura would stand up already 10 years ago and say, this is not right. We can avoid costs for the same quality of treatment for patients. We should go um, after this. Up to today, unfortunately, Lucentis is the only one and now it's again turning a bit in the media and uh, also other health insurance are on it. Um, but just an example for how Asura would stand up for, for its convictions. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is key, what's, what looks like a very simple uh, slide. I think it's foundational in, in brand building, in creating a brand positioning and then launching it into the market. So. We see on the left-hand side, what does the Sura stand for? What is your DNA? What are things you can really um, communicate out that are credible? You want to be different from competition. We saw it. And now you see the key there uh, that we worked on together with, uh, with Ventbridge, where it's sort of a two-in-one, but that's the beauty 
of it, of the tool and the methodology um, that they have. So you combine your client profiles that you have in the market and you find the one segment for you that is big enough so you can fulfill your growth ambitions. And you look at the unmet needs of exactly that segment. Because if you don't do that, you want to be everybody's darling. You have a very diluted uh, positioning, but you want a sharp one that fits your target customers. So only in combination, you get the best uh, data results. You would take that, feed it in what you call a brand positioning. Some have a brand key, some have a brand pyramid, a brand circle. There's all sorts of models, but at the end of the day, it describes what is your brand promise? What is your purpose? What are your strengths? How, do you, how are you different from competition? And you want that to then attract uh, the, the customers you want to, to grow. Okay. Now, to find out exactly these unmet needs of, this, of these profiles, of these segments, we propose jobs to be done or they contact, contacted us, the sewer contacted us because of jobs to be done. Jobs to be done in our thinking is a very powerful logic. It's a logic that helps you go away from your solution into the minds and the hearts of the customers. And um, it's powerful because when uh, innovation or also branding is solution agnostic, you find the better results. A solution is a solution and not a need. And that's why jobs to be done is really good. Um, a solution fulfills a need. And that's again captured in this, um, in this saying that most of you know, people don't want to drill, they want a hole in the wall. Um, it is a, a quote from Ted Levitt. Ted Levitt was a very charismatic uh, professor in marketing, actually in the 60s in the 60s when he coined, coined this, this sentence and when he, at the time, in the 70s, 80s, basically revolutionized marketing. Marketing was then moving from a feature-oriented sales approach to a benefit-oriented sales approach. And that was all uh, linked to, to this uh, Ted Levitt, or most of it was linked to this Ted Levitt, and also advertising agencies took it up. Um, and, and, and that's, in our view, the, the beginning of jobs to be done. Um, it then went into innovation. Uh, some of you might know Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christensen was promoting the jobs to be done concept in the beginning of 2000. And then it went into design thinking and today it is a very popular framework. But let me repeat, jobs to be done is just a logic. That's a powerful logic, but it's a logic. Um, and it has to be combined with other methodologies to make it really actionable. And this is what we'd like to show a little bit, give a little glimpse, Jan and I, over the next couple of uh, slides. First of all, um, jobs to be done has to be framed. The framing is a, is a key step. It's not rocket science. Um, it can be very simple, but if the framing is wrong, jobs to be done produces um, garbage. Now, why is it simple? This slide, okay, this slide is a simplification of, of what we did in, in Asura, but um, a job to be done can be on several levels. Uh, there were great discussions in, in, internally, how do we frame it? And we said there is one job which we called choose a new health insurance. And there was another job which we, which we called experience my health insurance. Two totally different jobs. Choose a health insurance is because in Switzerland, 10 to 20% of the customers change health insurance every year. Uh, it, it's, it's quite substantial. So there's a churn of customers because basically the service is the same, the coverage is the same, but the premiums, they change. So choose a new health insurance is, a, is an important job um, and, and we framed it like this. Experience my health insurance is what, what uh, Erasmus a little bit described. The, the touch point with, a, with, a, with an insurance is you pay your premium. So every month you get a bill and that's the touch point. And that's a very unpleasant touch point. And that's the experience you make. Um, so pay the premium is one of the experiences you make. Um, claim, yeah. If you have a problem, a health problem, you claim, you reimburse. 
That's another <laughs> touch point, another activity, another job that, that people do. Um, do inquiries, for example, is, is, is a certain treatment covered? Um, or complain is another, another uh, job that uh, people try to do. So what we do, what we say is we take a core job, we define this core job first as a hypothesis, we break it down into sub-jobs, simple, there are rarely more than five to seven sub-jobs for a core job. Uh, and, um, and then we go out with this as a hypothesis to exploration, to interviews with customers, to understand if it's right. Now, a little tip, um, uh, yes, still on this one and, uh, and also on the next one, a little tip. Those who start with jobs to be done get lost very quickly in our experience. They get lost because if you, if, 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 if you go out and you collect job after job on different levels, we end up with something which is on the slide, like lead my life. You go higher and higher um, and you end up with the meaning of life. So that's one of the risks. Um, that's why we frame it like this. Another, another tip is um, don't look for, for additional jobs. Don't make a collection of additional jobs because what really counts are not the jobs, but the problems that occur when people try to get a job done. That's the key to make job to, jobs to be done really actionable. So we look for problem. Now you can go on the next slide. We take this, this hierarchy, this pyramid, we have it in our mind, and then we talk to customers. 24 in-depth interview, each interview is like 90 minutes. And, and what we do is we find problems customers have when they try to get a job done. And in the end, we collected um, a hundred of these customer problems, which were all um, across this pyramid that you've seen before. A hundred customer problems identified in 24 in-depth interviews, qualitative interviews, um, not, not quantitative yet. It's really about the richness of these problems, covering all the problems that occur when people try to get these jobs done. So that's the that's the the core of it. We can go on, on the next slide. Um, what I just described is the qualitative part. So it's these twenty four interviews. We really want to find out which problems exist. We don't know. We don't want to find out yet which problems are really important and really matter. That's on the quant part on the right side. Um, once we have these hundred or so customer problems, um, we put it into a uh, quantitative uh, study with in fact 420 uh, people. There was a certain representative uh, mix of people, regions, uh, competitive problem, com competitive uh, users, etc. cetera. And, and there really we wanted to find out which problems really matter. And that's what Jan will explain in the next slide. Yeah, so just um, to give you an idea of, of what it means of taking kind of qualitative findings to the, to the quantitative stage and what we mean when we, when we ask, okay, which problems really matter? So what you're going to see in the, the next couple of slides and we, which will be a guiding framework as it is what we call the value map. And that is what you will see here. And you're going to see dots appear on this map and that map and each dot of that map is one of those customer problems. Now, what do we mean by problems matter? First of all, we mean they're on the right hand side. They are important to customers. So the x-axis is importance and the y-axis is kind of the fulfillment. The first step of knowing where a problem actually lies is we want it to be an important one. That Then we know that it matters. But problems, because we only know them from the qualitative side, can already be fulfilled for the majority of the market or not. So right, right on the upper hand, we'll, there would be problems which are important to customers, but they are already fulfilled. On the lower right uh, hand, so on the lower right, there is the interesting basket. And for us, the most interesting basket, there is all the problems that are important, but they're not yet fulfilled. Those we call pain points. And pain points are 
those customer problems, which for a large part of the market or a segment are important, but not yet fulfilled. And that's kind of the lever where you have to approach the solutions that you have to focus on to actually provide value and then be recognized by the customer. So just maybe giving a, a quick idea of what zero and 10 means. So on each scale, we have a zero to 10 scale. 10 means just that all of the people in that group find it very important or all of those people found the problem fulfilled. Um, and zero means none of the people found um, that that problem was important to them or it was fulfilled. So 10 means all of them, zero is none of them. So it's kind of the left-hand side is the low, right-hand side is high, the bottom is low and the upper upper part is high as well. So what does that mean? So let's put some points in there. That's the actual data. So we asked uh, a large sample of people to rate each of those 100 customer problems in terms of importance and satisfactions. Now, one you can actually, one, once you have that data, once you, so you know how important it is to people and how satisfied they already are, you can map them on this value map and you know which one are pain points and which one are essentials. So that's kind of the, those that you have to focus on that you, now we know that which customer problems are actually um, relevant or actually they matter actually to our customers. Now, what we see here is kind of, you can have such a map for all the 420 people that are in there in the market, or let's say for Switzerland, for all the people who have insurance in Switzerland. But that is not really the thing that we're after here. So we don't want to serve everyone, as um, Asura, as Rasmus has pointed out before, we had to get a little bit more sophisticated in just addressing the problems of everybody and how that sophistication came about, Rasmus will tell you a little bit more. Yeah, um, so what you see here is, um, is basically that if you cut the full study and the full data into different sub-segments, you will always get a different cloud. Now, to build your brand, what's important is you want to know what are overall the category drivers. So if you have the 100 points, 100 possible benefits or drivers that trigger people, you want to know what is the list 1 to 20. And your brand should represent a few of these one to 20 ones and be able to be more relevant and better on those than your competition. If you pick, if you pick dots that are at the bottom of the list, yeah, you can be very differentiated on it, but you have no customers that are interested in it. So what we did here with this methodology and with the tool was we did with, yeah, I don't know, cluster analysis, I'm not a statistical expert, but um, we did a few cuts to see what are these segments. We had hypothesis on how do we cluster? Do we cluster by pain points? Do we cluster by sociodemographics? Do we cluster by attitudes to life? Do we cluster by attitudes to health, etc.? In order to come out um, with, uh, with something that would make sense with who a sore is, where we're coming from, what successes in the past have, have been, to find a cloud where we can have credible pain points we can stand for and yet be different to competition. Maybe this clustering, can I add something? Because it's a, it was a nice story. In, internally in Ventbridge, we still um, celebrate this moment. We have tools to, to cluster um, and, and basically makes clustering very easy. And it's an iterative process and it's uh, guided by hypotheses and then results come out um, and then we presented these results. But Asura really pushed us, pushed us to the limit in this. So we really, we had, we had to get uh, really strong on the analytics. Um, and um, I don't know if I mentioned that to you, Osmos, but we went to an outside expert mathematician mm -hmm. to really yeah. um, satisfy also your, your needs because uh, you, you were really demanding in this. Um, in yeah, the end, yeah, the guy. In the, the end, guy our approach has, has 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 brought the right solution, but you wanted really to find out more, which was yeah, no, the, the my hiring manager at the time, um, amazing guy. I probably put him into the top three of marketeers, but when it came to data, he also would be extremely demanding. So that <laughs> that pushed us. Okay. 
Yeah, now um, we get into yeah, a few examples of areas of category drivers. So it becomes a bit more tangible for you. And it's mainly three pain areas and then one no pain area as a contrast. So first one, we see that there's a topic in terms of category drivers around serious illness. And the beauty then of the methodology of Benbridge is that you can get quite granular. So um, what triggers people when it comes to serious illness, there's, there's segments where you have things like um, the best possible treatment in case of a serial illness, or uh, I want the maximum comfort uh, in the treatment for serious illness, or even before the serious illness happens is that uh, it's important to me, prevention is important to prevent serious illness, or um, financial issues linked to it. So you've got to know what the big trigger is, but then the way you shape your brand, you're, you also want to know what is this exact pain point of the target that I go after. On the second one, so this is a, this is a standard one. I don't know if any of you work in insurance, but when you look at NPS scores, uh, et cetera, uh, it's this thing of hassle-free interactions with the insurance. Now, what does that mean? It's, it's huge um, again. So yeah, it's a, it's a driver, but how do you do it that you do the right things? So in the case of health insurance, for instance, you have um, the speed of uh, reimbursements. You quickly get your money back. And um, that is for some people a very important thing when it comes to this hassle-free element. You also have that you don't want to fight to get uh, reimbursed. It's another thing. Or linked to it too is I want to understand why I'm not getting a reimbursement. So the need for information around it. I want to be I want to be told um, you're not getting this. Or is it simply when you interact that it is it is easy to do so in the pain point you don't say um somebody is not on mute but they're putting noises out if if people could check yes. the mute sorry exactly so could somebody please michael that would be great um yeah and then it's like the beauty of this methodology is as well, you don't say, um, I want an app or I want a chatbot. Uh, that's not how it goes. It, it stays more abstract to the example of the drill that we are put out, um, but it's another area. So simplicity of, 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 of calling them, talking to them, exchanging documents with my insurer. So you see, you have four different fields and we could, with the data we got, pick the right one and insert it into the brand. And this is the muscle that also we want the strengths. And it's four completely different things. Quickly reimbursing, giving the right information, avoiding that people have to fight. It's completely different areas you, you can be strong at. Yeah, and then big driver in the category and this also with the success is, is linked to, we often have the best premiums. Um, and we knew there's something there, obviously big category driver. It's a massive um, category driver. Um, we also know that we can't only rely on this. So I'm also to always talking about the wheel with the spokes and the center of the wheel, where in the past the premiums, but we need to build spokes to have a strong brand. But yet again, what does it mean? Premiums must stay low. It's, there's people who are willing to pay a certain price to also get a certain quality. Or is it value for money uh, in a broader term? Is it that when I switch insurance, I don't want the yo-yo effect of the premiums going up 5% in the following year. And I'm like, damn it, now I got to change again. So continuity of premiums, or is it just, they got to be damn cheap. And here again, we got, we got some very powerful um, insights for us on, on what the exact thing is we want to we wanna be best at in with our brand and in communicating it. Then last but not least, um, it's also worth 
to look at the non-drivers. So you will have your hypothesis of what are, what are triggers for people. Um, and here's one where we saw that in for our segment, as a concrete example, uh, this maximum choice of treatment is, is not a pain area. And obviously as an insurance who are not amazing on the service end of things and on cramming more and more benefits into complementary insurance products, you know, we were asking ourselves the question, do we, do we need that? Do we need to be uh, at the max like, like the others? And yeah, we have a demanding target, but we certainly don't have one that, that wants the max and everything. They're a bit more clever. They rather would say, no, I want the optimal treatment, not like the maximum choice of, of treatment types. On um, as well an important element of the full story, so the, the rebranding, it shows again how powerful it is when you have defined your client segment with their needs because it feeds your positioning. With the positioning, you have brand attributes that you want to stand for. And in a quantitative study, which we did on a good uh, six different visual identities in all colors and all shapes with all sorts of photography, um, you can quantitatively test amongst your target consumers if they rate you high or low on all the different brand attributes that you want to stand for. And also the golden question, you can ask people if they would consider buying a product with this company. So you know the purchase intent um, as well. So to the day today, I can't tell you why people read and read and in squares and in this lady you see there and in this type font, why they read the brand attributes we want. That answer, that question I can't answer, but I know they do. And this is the visual identity that best fit um, these attributes. And it also scored the highest on uh, the purchase intent amongst the brand target that we're looking for um, in the market. So. People often say, yeah, did you choose red because you like red? <laughs> no, I don't care. It's the, the target likes it. So we, we do it. Um, and we also hope for, as we now execute it more and more, that we keep also the differentiation uh, versus the other brands. And it's, it's, it's all elements together uh, that make it photography, type font, logo, colors, and shapes to be, to be distinct um, from the other brands in the market. So yeah, what's next? Um, the beauty is I already see the brand being used to develop products. We launched a new base insurance model. Um, I see huge, huge brand fit there. How we want to develop the website, our mobile app, um, it's there. How do we want to communicate the brand, um, the planning in there? So um, we have a big roadmap of lots of activities. And we hope that, um, you know, we bring our brand closer and closer to, to consumers, uh, keep nurturing it so people see the value in it, see how it's distinct, and that we hopefully can grow the business uh, further and continue the growth path that we had in the past 10 years. Okay, so thank you very much, um, um, Rasmus. So they, this kind of really... Um, closes the story or closes the loop uh, and, and of course is I'm quite interested in seeing um, how this actually will then play out once you once you put out whatever is next um, and we are going to open up for, for Q&A so if you want you can ask your question directly um, then please give us some kind of sign or write it in the chat and then you can ask it directly First of all, I want to maybe start by, we hinted at it um, already by asking a question I, I want to ask. And um, we hinted at it already. There were three different segments of customers shown. And very often, if we talk about segmentation, people think of classical social demographics, so male versus female or age groups and so on. So could you maybe a little bit elaborate on how these segments then are, are defined? Yeah, so you got to, uh, people think the machine or cluster analysis can spit out a segment, but you got to, it's actually not true. You got to feed it something. So you will in, always influence the, the analysis. So we fed in and we said, uh, we want to cluster by, for instance, self deductibles. We want to cluster by male, female. We want to cluster by socio demographics, older versus younger. 
family, non-family. We want to cluster by attitudes to life and uh, health. And what you then get is um, you get different segments, you get the size of them, and you can also measure how homogenous the segment that you would go for is within and how heter heterogeneous it is compared to other segments. So there's some statistical analysis that gives you indications on it. And we had this huge matrix mapping where we had these figures in there to see, it's called, I think, um, a congregate differentiation index or CDI or what did you call it, Jan? Um, uh, that's actually almost a better name, but <laughs> we call it differently. <laughs> for, but yeah, it was the CDI. So it's a measurement that we make kind of telling exactly that. So how uh, homogenous is a group and how different are they from the other so that we can calculate a, a number from it. Cut and we saw, exactly. And we saw we won, we have a sizable segment that to fulfill our growth uh, ambitions in all parts of the country. And we have one that is very differentiated if we actually segment based on attitudes uh, to life and health. Mm -hmm. um, so that was then the choice that, that, yeah. that, that we made basically. Now, I think that's really interesting to show that this is kind of a combination of, so this is not purely classical segmentation. There is a part of it which is need-based, where we calculated this, how different are their needs, and there's a part of it that's attitude-based. So that's quite a, that's what I meant at the beginning with a quite a sophisticated approach, I, I think. And, okay, so there are several questions that people put, um, put to you. I think... Um, uh, there's a beautiful one by Jim. Hi, Jim. So how does this relate to the blue um, blue ocean strategy? Um, I think that's probably... Hi, Jim. There he is. Um, <laughs> that's probably a question either for me uh, or Beato. I don't know if Ros Erasmus, you want to elaborate on that. I have it in front of me. I have it in front of me, Jan, if you allow. Um, we have an article on the website um, where we uh, put some thoughts together on blue ocean. We liked the blue ocean concept when it came out. We liked it a lot because it, um, it, it, it opens up new dimensions um, so that you go from a red ocean to a blue ocean. Um, we think um, somehow jobs to be done helps this perspective change from a blue ocean to a red ocean. The job to be done changes this perspective and makes it more easier to find blue oceans. We think the pain points, the way we, we define it, uh, so quantitative pain points, can show basically the way into the blue ocean. It can, it can It's like a roadmap. It's like a guide to identify dimensions, concrete relevant dimensions that are in this, uh, in this blue ocean uh, field. Um, I think jobs to be done also takes you away from the customer. Uh, uh, no, sorry, takes you away from the competitor. The Blue Ocean is a very much, in, in our perception, a, a competitive uh, framework, competitive uh, strategy framework, um, which, 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 which still looks at the competitors. Jobs to be done is really competitive free. It really looks only at the customer. And another element is, uh, is the confidence. When we validate, we know for sure that this pain point is really relevant. Uh, we are really, I mean, as sure as you can get that if you focus your solution on this pain point, it will be successful in the market. It has almost predictable power. So that's my answer to the blue ocean question. Jan, maybe you want to complement on this? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's uh, I mean, that's that's kind of our stance. So so what is what is interesting here is, is also that... Um, maybe thinking about blue oceans in terms of strategy, right? Or in branding. So, so uh, here was kind of a space where the, 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 the space of available brands that were out there, uh, they were kind of in the red ocean. So Asura is, and at least from my perspective, kind of the only brand that has really then found a way of, 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 of really going into a different direction and, and kind of figuring out what a blue ocean in terms of branding um, um, can be and jobs to be done, I think, can can really help here because you don't focus on on the competition and, and believe you have to provide the same services as they do. 
you focus on the customer and your target group. So that that might help. Which ties into the question of Mike. Huh? Would you please talk about how you selected the two jobs? It seems like solution was already identified, um, which is a very uh, right remark. When we start framing, we start with the solution and then we move away from the, from the solution. Now, what you don't see on the slide is are the jobs between, remember there was a higher level job to lead a life and then there was these very solution-oriented core jobs. The magic was in between. What's in between? And we have not shown that, um, but uh, there were lots of reflections and discussions. What, what's the purpose, what's the goal of an insurance in the normal life of the people? And, and it's really something about survive financially. It's something about uh, deal, with, deal with problems deals with, with surprises, for example, that happen. Um, and, and this was all in this hierarchy and it was all in these discussions when we framed it. Um, for us, these, these framing discussions are really crucial because we, we are the ones afterwards going into exploration. We need this thinking uh, of the client and our thinking to do the explorations in the right way. Otherwise we get lost or we find something that we already know, and that's not what we want. Okay, great. So please also um, ask follow-ups if you want. Um, there is another question that is going to you, Erasmus. So he, there is Sergio who is asking, how did you approach the pain areas besides branding and communication after the project? So he says, hassle-free, for example, did you actually change the process or tools that you provide as an insurance to address those pain points? So kind of what were the, the uses of the results beyond the, the branding uh, um, aspect, if I understand the question correctly? Um, yeah, I give two examples. So one is just a simple proof point example. We, we have a mobile app, so it's a low hanging fruit. Uh, you can communicate on it um, and we're doing it. So you have a proof point to say, look, uh, you have simple interactions uh, with us. Another one is the need for information and information accuracy, which goes through the letters that insurance writes you, giving you an explanation on why you're not reimbursed or reimbursed on something. Sprachleitfaden, uh, editorial. So the way you write, um, actually, when you address the customer, and this is something that gets translated into um, overhauling. It's a it's it's a project we're on, where we overhaul the letters and the way we write to people, so we're clearer and giving them the right information. It's it's another example. Okay, so if I understand, there was a little bit of an issue with the connection. So if I understand you right, there was the one where you focused on the on the app, where you use it in kind of designing the app, and the other one is really the communication, the letter communication. That was also in the overhaul of that um, paper com uh, communication with the client. That the pain points were used to sharpen that as well. Yeah. Okay. Good summary. Okay. <laughs> Great. So there is another question. Um, we already touched it a little bit. So maybe I'm asking Max Johansson to, to, to specify his question. So he, he's asking, would you please talk about how you cluster the people? So in, 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 in what sense do you, do you want to know more about this clustering process? So there was quite of uh, analytics involved and building hypothesis. And then you just iteratively find the, the, maybe the I can build. Maybe I can build on it, Jan. Mm -hmm. um, it was a three-step process. Um, step number one was a, an inside-out set of inside-out criteria, which I don't mention now. I don't tell you which ones, but these inside-out uh, analysis of the, of the existing customer base gave us some uh, indications uh, which we could use in the questionnaire. Um, let's call them profile questions. There were three, two to three questions that linked back to their existing customer base. That was the first step. Then there was the second step, which was um, attitude questions and value questions, beliefs. 
So in the questionnaire, there, were, there was a set of questions which had to do with attitudes, hmm? beliefs that people had, which we identified in the qualitative, uh, in the qualitative uh, exploration. So for example, I make an example, there are people who, want, who, who always want to have um, the help from the others. And there are people who are more self-responsible. And you can see that in their certain in certain behaviors, also in other in other in other categories. Um, for example, take a car insurance. I take a car insurance that has a high uh, franchise, self-deductible franchise, or uh, I take a car insurance that covers everything, and so on. So there were a set of attitude questions, um, uh, which was the second step. And the third step was where we looked at the needs. And then we compared the different segments which came out and, and looked at differences. So sometimes we had no differences or little differences of, the, of these segments. That was not good enough. And then uh, we looked further and we changed the profile answers and we suddenly had different differences that were large enough. Was that okay, Rasmus? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's... And that's probably where the, the thing is and where statisticians are interested is you you feed the machine something and tell you tell the machine segment by sociodemographic segment by attitudes. And this is something that's an input that you give. So it's not completely a, a perfect segmentation that's falling out of the sky. And but for me <laughs> in all segmentation studies I've seen, it's always the case. You then got to check heterogeneity, heterogeneity and uh, homogeneous, uh, the segment is from within. And if it's sizable enough to fulfill your, your gross ambitions, um, for me, that's fine. But if one day I learn about different ways to do it, uh, write me an email. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So I think that has satisfied uh, uh, Max because he's written many thanks. <laughs> there is an, uh, an additional question I found very interesting. So um, the question is, can you please give an example, maybe it's hard to, to, to think of one, but can you please give an example of a job or a problem that was in the important unmet quadrant? So there was a pain point, but you decided not to focus on and kind of explain a little bit the decision why. So the question I think is, is, is why I like it is kind of it, the larger question. And I think that probably or many people have is, do you really need to solve all your customer problems? Or can you, <laughs> can you also pick and choose, right? So somebody you have this idea that we have to solve all the problems um, and, and then we really struggle to do it. Or can you take a conscious decision not to focus on the problem? And I, I honestly don't exactly remember, uh, Rasmus, if that was the case uh, here, but, but the question is actually a very, very interesting one. Um, how was it? Remember how we had one, two, three, four, and we saw that four is in our segment, a topic that's, that's very important, simplicity, but transparency, I don't remember. Okay, before I go into a babble, we basically, we picked the ones that were very far to the right, where there was pain, so unfulfilled, and you can only pick that many. And that's what we focused on. And we certainly let a few aside because they, we couldn't link them to a bigger theme or they were too divergent from the ones we already have. But I unfortunately uh, don't have an example there. Yeah. Mm. I think what, you, what you're hinting at is also, so that is maybe an also an, an aspect that we were looking for is, is also there a segment that has unique pain points or that has something which is the other segments have as a pain point, but that one not. So that these questions uh, also figure into yeah. the, the so, segmentation. Yeah, you, I mean, yeah, what you certainly, it's never as beautiful as we would like <laughs> to tell it here today. That's true. So you see, you, you see differences, but it's never black and white. Mm. Um, where you get closer to black and white is the combination of the category drivers, the pain points you pick and this pack then together, that will make your brand. There you get closer to black and white. But on a single pain point, yeah, you see differences. You clearly see, yeah, this is much more important for these people compared to those of this other segment. Uh, but it's probably not a world. 
it's just little sums of things together that will make the big difference yeah yeah that was actually a beautiful um, um almost closing word so there are no more questions in the chat if you have any more please um ask them now or or kind of raise your hand or show that you want to ask a question and then go ahead but otherwise i think we have answered and keep your eyes open if you're living in switzerland keep your eyes open and think about <laughs> when you see the red asura um think about this talk and uh and uh I hope you will be surprised positively. Good. So I think that kind of closes the, the session. Thank you very much, uh, Rasmus, for taking this time and, and, and showing us, uh, giving us kind of a sneak peek of what was happening behind the rebranding of, of Asura. And thanks um, all of the participants here. Um, we will keep you updated uh, for such talks and um, have a nice evening or day, wherever you are. Reach out to us if you have a more question. Huh? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you very much. Thank you all.